Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are here today to announce uh, Bill 8. Minister. Thanks, Ethan. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm uh, pleased to announce that I will be introducing the Alberta Firearms Act in the legislature late, later on today. Now, once passed, the Alberta Firearms Act will be the most comprehensive provincial firearms framework in the country and enable Alberta to create a regulatory framework to protect the provincial jurisdiction of the province and the rights of law-abiding firearms owners. Now, over the past few years, the federal government has rapidly introduced a series of firearms policy changes that have negatively impacted law-abiding Albertans. Albertans have expressed frustration with these actions from the federal government and confusion about how firearms are regulated here in Alberta. The lack of a legislative mandate for Alberta's role in the joint federal-provincial regulation of firearms adds to this confusion and uncertainty, and it fails to assert the province's jurisdiction in this area. A Provincial Firearms Act gives us the tools that we need to stand up for the rights of Albertans uh, who are firearms owners and to protect our unique heritage. The Act would establish the role of the Chief Firearms Officer in legislation to provide the Chief Firearms Officer with a stronger, clearer role and mandate in their duties to administer the Federal Firearms Act. It would also empower our Chief Firearms Officer to advocate more strongly on behalf of Albertans to have the Federal Government reconsider policy changes that infringe on their rights. And it would increase the Alberta Chief Firearms Office's visibility and accountability to the public with the requirement to publish an annual report. This legislation is focused on defining and strengthening the role of the Chief Firearms Officer here in Alberta. And it would enable Alberta to leverage the areas of jurisdiction that we have through regulations that help to preserve public confidence in the integrity of the firearms control program. Now specifically, Alberta could create regulations to respond to federal actions that negatively impact law-abiding firearms owners here in the province. For example, the seizure and confiscation of firearms. Because of this legislation, Alberta could create a regulation regarding who in this province can be involved in taking part in this. Through regulations, Alberta could also establish our expectations that firearms owners are fairly compensated for seized firearms. Regulations could also be developed to prevent municipalities and municipal police services from entering into funding agreements with the federal government. I'd like to emphasize that none of these measures are fully developed in the Act. As I said earlier, the Act gives us the flexibility to quickly develop these responses in regulations to respond to the federal government's actions. Now, in conclusion, every Albertan should be concerned about the precedent set by the federal intrusion into property rights of law-abiding and responsible Albertans. The activities of our law-abiding firearms community are essential to the economic vibrancy and the cultural her heritage of this province. Firearms owners are hunters and those who lead a traditional way of life. There are sports shooters and collectors of firearms of Albertan and Canadian cultural and historical significance. There are more than 680 firearms-related businesses in Alberta and more than 127 approved shooting ranges. And these businesses and these individuals deserve clarity, they deserve accountability and advocacy to protect their property rights. And that is what this legislation aims to do. Thank you. I, I am also joined here today, I should have said from the top, with the Deputy Chief Firearms Officer, Patrick Fitzhenry, who will be able to take any technical questions that I'm not able to answer for you folks. And with that, Ethan, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Minister. Uh, we are going to start in the room. Please identify yourself and the organization you represent. And please keep it to one question and one follow-up. Minister, what's the desired, like going big picture, what's the desired effect of all these measures that you're taking? Are you hoping the federal government will back down from, from their firearms gun grab or confiscation program, buyback program? Are you hoping that they'll change, C, toss C-21 entirely or change it? Like, big picture, what do you want? Well, first of all, I, number one goal with this piece of legislation is to provide clarity, uh, which has been lacking in, in every province, quite frankly. 
Um, so the clarity in the role between federal government and provincial governments in the regulation of, of firearms. But when you ask about the confiscation program of the federal government, yes, of course, we've, we've been opposed to it from the beginning. Um, and it's not just C21. You have to remember this started in May of 2020 with the order in council. So we, we've opposed the, the measures that the federal government has taken. We do oppose the confiscation program. We've been calling on the federal government, along with other provinces as well. Uh, we're not the only province to be calling on them in, um, in ending this. And one of the reasons is because it keeps on changing. The, the, uh, the details um, have never been provided to the provinces, but the few details that we have been provided have been changing. For example, it's, uh, instead of being implemented nationwide, it's now starting in PEI. Uh, we don't think that they have the resources or the wherewithal to be able to implement this uh, program. And as well, we understand from the FPT, the, the Conference of Deputy Ministers, that now they're indicating to provincial governments that the amnesty that was scheduled to end in October of this year is now being extended, which just shows that they don't have the resources and, as I said, the wherewithal to be implementing this confiscation program. I just want to ask you also about your Law Society hearing. It's now been rescheduled to continue in June. Um, how are the voters of Calgary Acadia supposed to make an informed decision about your character when they go to the polls in May? Uh, as I have been since uh, 2020, I'm sub Judas. I have no comment uh, other than to say that I look forward to resolving the matter. Minister, since we're on the topic of off-topic questions, I wanted to ask you, since this is the first time that we've chatted with you since uh, the story broke in January about um, CBC News saying that the Premier and her office have been uh, pressuring you around COVID-related cases, and I was wondering if you could explain to Albertans um, what that pressure has been like uh, and how or if you think it's been inappropriate. Well, I, I think the Premier answered this question uh, in question period last week when she was asked by uh, the opposition. Um, she pointed out that, yes, she, she did campaign um, on um, investigating whether there was a possibility. Uh, I think the words that were used were clemency or pardoning or, or amnesty for those who were charged with a COVID-related uh, situation. Um, since she won in October, she's received the advice of her Attorney General, me, and she's accepted that advice. Um, I don't have anything further to say about have it. you felt pressured? I, well, as I said, I've, I've given her advice. I, I, I'll keep my conversations with the Premier uh, private. Thank you. About this bill, like, is it fair to say that this is basically trying to throw up roadblocks in front of the federal government enacting the measures in C21 in the province? Because a lot of this stuff is, we could do this. We could enact this regulation. We could do that. So, so how would you characterize the bill? Like, are you trying to make it difficult for Ottawa? No, I, I'd say I'd characterize it as being nimble. Uh, that's, that's important because we don't have any details yet. And I think that's why our approach to this, this framework is different than Saskatchewan's, is because we, we don't have any details from the federal government yet. And then once we do uh, see those details, what we have here that's being proposed in Bill 8 is an opportunity for us to be nimble and to develop regulations, respond to that at, at that time. When does the bill come into effect? We didn't get that information today. Well, they'll, they'll be, it depends on, on different parts of it. There'll be parts of it that relate to the role of the, the Chief Firearms Office, um, which will be on proclamation, um, which um, I, I think will be very quickly after it's passed. But for the other parts of it, um, it'll be when the regulations are developed, um, as is common with, um, with legislation that it has enabling clauses to develop a reg. Um, and that, that will depend on, on when we get details from the federal government on the confiscation program. So the, the, the chief firearms officer office is getting like more than double the employees, right? So from 30 to 70, that's what we were told today. And we were also told that the federal government funds the office about 70%, 69 to 70%. Is the federal government going to give you guys more money for this, or are you going to make up the difference? Well, I, I, my last time I got briefed on it, we are still in conversations with the federal government. We are expecting them to fund the, the office uh, accordingly because they, they are, as we announced in September of last year, having the Chief Firearms Office uh, here in Alberta processing applications. So there's an obligation for the federal government to provide funding, um, but the, I think those details are still being worked out with the federal government. 
And Mr. Patrick, you said that, that correct? this would it's still being worked out. Yes. That's right. You said that this would prevent municipalities and municipal police services from entering into funding agreements with the federal government. I'm wondering one, if you could expand on that, but also two, have they asked for this sort of thing? Well, first, I, I say that this is building on Bill 211 from former um, MLA Glasgow, which uh, was a, a private member's bill uh, that prevented municipalities from banning firearms and infringing on, on provincial jurisdiction. Um, and uh, so this is, this is building on that work that began with former MLA Glasgow um, and, and making sure that when, when the Municipal Government Act was first drafted years ago, back in the 90s, that the, the, the powers that are provided to municipalities was very broad in Section 7. And so building on that work that began with Bill 211, this is beginning or this is continuing that work to make sure that uh, when it comes in particular to issues related to public safety, which is incumbent on the provincial government to, to regulate and to oversee, that we're going to make sure, um, for example, when, when we have increased movement uh, uh, and, and transportation and storage, of, of firearms, that's a concern for the, the provincial government to make sure that our communities are safe and make sure that we're, we have legislation targeted on ensuring that. But have municipalities actually come to the government and asked for this? Municipalities, municipal services, but when municipalities, I, I haven't spoken to municipalities uh, particularly about this. And this government is always talking about overreach by the federal government. What about overreach from the provincial government into municipal governance? Well, as I said, the, the uh, administration of justice is, is provincial jurisdiction. Ensuring public safety is provincial jurisdiction. When we have, as I said, increased movement and increased transportation, increased storage of firearms in our communities, that's, that's something that is incumbent on the provincial government to be able to, to look at and, and, and be able to deal with to ensure that our communities are safe. But this would take over municipal jurisdiction, would it not? No, no, it would not. This is provincial jurisdiction, as I said, the administration of justice. But they couldn't enter in, into any federal agreements by themselves? Well, if, if, if and when there is a regulation that is developed, this uh, allows the provincial government to develop a regulation to, to deal with a situation like that, but that would depend on the federal government providing us with details. And, and once we see those details, this would enable the provincial government to develop a regulation dealing with a situation like but that. The funding, federal funding come into that? I, I may not understand the question. Yeah, yeah. So, you, so you say you want to make sure municipalities don't get federal funding as it relates to firearms. What, what sorts of things? I'm not understanding. Is it is it that the transportation of firearms would be given to municipalities, and you say you don't want that funded? What? I'm I'm just very confused. Well, we're all confused, and that's why this point of Bill Eight to be able to provide clarity when it comes to the province's role in the regulation of firearms, and the the role and the clarity of the role of the Chief Firearms Office for for us here in Alberta, um, and and. Uh, you're right. It is confusing because they've changed a lot of the details that, or the few details that have even been public when it comes to the confiscation program. Uh, dates have changed. Um, who's going to be involved in it have changed. People that they've solicited to be involved in the confiscation of firearms has changed. So we don't know those details. And it is confusing. Uh, we look forward to getting those details from the federal government. And when they do, then this at least has enabling clauses for the provincial government in the future to be able to uh, develop regulations related to that. If you, don't, if you don't know what's in the bill, then, like, or very limited, why you just wait till the bill is tabled? Like, the, the bill, like, it, it, like it, it, in its entirety. Well, I don't think it'll be a bill. This is, um, there would be no new bill. You're talking about the federal government? Yeah. Why would there be a new bill? What you're talking about, like, I don't know the details, we don't know the details, we don't know a lot of the details. Well, then why, why is it so incumbent, or why is it such an urgent issue for you right now to have this bill, your bill, Bill 8? I, I think, as I said off the top, th this is really important for us to make sure that there's clarity when it comes to firearms regulation and the different roles that the feds and the provinces have, uh, the role of the chief firearms officer. We have... Um, this has been going on since May of 2020. It's when the, the first order in council occurred. We also have Bill C-21. We have years of the federal government continuing to develop policy that is negatively impacting uh, Albertans. And it's, it's now 2023. We have the amnesty, which was originally proposed to end in, in October of 23. We now understand that they're proposing to extend that amnesty. But I think as they um, are now 
unveiling and, and rolling out the confiscation program at PEI, we're now getting some of those details. And when we get more details, we'll, we'll have legislation that has enabling clauses to allow the provincial government to, to react as we get more details. Minister, you keep saying clarity and you keep saying this bill brings clarity. So if, if you can give us an idea, like clarify your thinking behind these potential regulations, like what, in which type of situation do you see being able to use a regulation in a funding agreement with the municipality, or in, in which type of situation do you see the regulation being used to stop certain individuals or organizations from being able to confiscate firearms? Like, where question. do you see those things happening? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. Because I, I forget sometimes when I, I do these briefings before uh, letting the press know about legislation that's going to be tabled. I've seen it, and you guys haven't yet, so I, I get that. So the, the um, enabling clause for developing regulations has about 60 subclauses. So there's about 60 different enumerated ways they'll be specifying how the provincial government may be able to develop regs. So, so it, is, it is specific, um, and, uh, and, and I, I look forward to, to being able to, to debate those subclauses and, and the rest of the legislation in the, uh, the legislature. Thank you, everyone. We're going to go to the uh, phone lines now. Operator, please put through the first caller. Alex McQuig, Western Producer. Thanks for taking my call. I guess, uh, my, my first question is, uh, how is limiting uh, those responsible for public safety, such as municipalities uh, and police services, how is uh, limiting their funding enhanced or better or do anything but make it worse for these public safety um, uh, bodies to continue to do their work? Well, I, I'd say that provinces play an important role uh, by administering uh, the, the Federal Firearms Act, which gives provinces the authority to um, on, on issues such as licensing, transfers, and transportation of firearms. Uh, and, and provinces also have their jurisdiction over firearms from a property and civil rights perspective. So uh, as, as well as the Constitution delegating to the provinces the ad administration of justice as uh, provincial jurisdiction, it's incumbent on the provinces then to be able to work in ensuring public safety uh, by, as I said in, in previous questions, with, if there is a seizure program, if there is a confiscation program, there are, would be thousands of firearms with increased movement throughout the province, increased storage, increased transportation, and it's incumbent on the province to ensure that it is done safely by having um, potentially uh, regulations that would have uh, licensing but also be prescribing who is and, and isn't going to be included and involved in, in a, a seizure program like that. Do you have a follow-up? Yeah, yeah, but how is defunding police in this manner, or potentially defunding police in this manner, how is that going to improve the overall safety of Albert? Well, there is no defunding of police. The, the, the provinces and the municipalities will continue to fund the municipal police services, all seven of them, the same way that they have in the past. If a municipality or a municipal service wants to begin uh, conversations uh, with a federal government on taking federal money to taking those resources off the street to be able to be involved in a confiscation program, that doesn't make our communities any more safe, and that's a conversation that is now going to uh, have to include the provincial government if this uh, bill passes. Thank you. Operator, please put through the next caller. Neil, Alberta Outdoor Man Magazine. <laughs> well, that was kind of close, but not, no, no cigar. Uh, Minister, can you address the uh, 20,000 ton gorilla in the room here, which of course is the Supreme Court of Canada? This thing is going to end up to be is going to be challenged by somebody. It's inevitably going to be end up uh, before the Supreme Court. Uh, we have a, a very unenviable track record before the court. Many Albertans think the court is uh, many, is deliberately rigged against us, and we can continue to use an Alberta expression, getting our asses handed to us. How are you going to make sure that this is actually going to be go going to be operational, or are you just or is this just another one of those? angry letters that the uh, Premier talked about during her leadership campaign? I'm, I'm not going to agree with a lot of the preface uh, to your question, but I think uh, that our uh, government over the last three and a half years has had a lot of success in, in defending itself in, in the courts. 
uh, in uh, some of the new ways that we've been amending legislation or had new regulations that have, um, have been implemented through order and council um, and with a focus on improving the lives of Albertans for the, the last three and a half years. Uh, and that's going to be the, continue to be the case for us. Um, we believe that this is uh, constitutionally viable, uh, what we uh, are including in, in Bill 8. And uh, I look forward to, to debating uh, the, uh, the bill in, in the legislature. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up? Follow-up? Do I get a follow-up? Uh, yep. I see no mention of First Nations or Métis here in, in any of your documentation. Uh, how are they going to be included or are they not included in these protections? Uh, well, good question. Um, and uh, yes, of course, we, we want to be able to work with um, uh, our Indigenous communities um, here in the province when it comes to, to firearms. Um, we have not specifically engaged with uh, Indigenous communities before introducing the legislation, but the, um, the Chief Firearms Office uh, does conduct ongoing engagement with uh, the firearms community, and that includes Indigenous firearms owners. Uh, and the government may engage with Indigenous uh, communities as part of the regulation development. As I said, this is, um, uh, much as this is um, enabling clauses to uh, allow a future government to, to develop a regulation down the road. Um, and, and I would say that this legislation, uh, the point of it is, is intended at strengthening our ability to advocate on behalf of lawful firearms owners, and some of whom are Indigenous and may use firearms for subsistence hunting. And our, our stance from the beginning, um, in particular with the, the amendments that were proposed to C-21, is that those amendments were targeting uh, Indigenous um, uh, communities that, that, that required those, those types of firearms for subsistence uh, hunting. And that was a concern from us from the beginning. Uh, and it continues to be our concern. So we look forward to continuing to engage with uh, Indigenous communities here in Alberta on, on this issue. All right, we're going to return to the room. Um, go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, on the forensic and ballistic testing of all confiscated firearms, I guess I'm wondering if, if whether the, that's all, something that's already done and whether you have concerns that the whoever is confiscating these firearms have been sloppy and it gets leaked out of evidence and onto the street to commit crimes. Like, what's the, what's the purpose behind this? Oh, well, if, if you have a massive confiscation program of thousands of firearms throughout the province, uh, it could potentially be a great way for someone to get rid of a, uh, a firearm that was used in, in a crime. So it's, I, I think it's important for us to ensure that if there, there are going to be firearms that are confiscated, that, that we have that information that could be provided to police down the road and making sure that our communities are safe by, by having that type of, of targeted um, uh, initiative. I don't know, Patrick, do you want to say anything else about that, or does that cover? It, I think it's important. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks, Minister. Uh, I think it's important to, to point out, yes, that, that that's a part of it. And, and some of what we're, we're doing with the expansion of the ACFO is, is a dedicated um, special investigations and integrated operations unit that will work closely with law enforcement and everything that we can do to ensure public safety and, and sometimes ballistic testing will be required as, as, as part of that. So, um, yeah, it makes perfect sense for us. So if somebody committed a crime with a gun, they probably aren't going to voluntarily give it back as part of a gun buyback program then? Well, they certainly, uh, they certainly uh, would give it back perhaps if, if there was no ballistic or, or forensic testing. It would be an ideal opportunity. I'm not a criminal mastermind myself. Uh, but uh, I, I could see that it would be an opportunity that, that uh, wouldn't uh, uh, be ignored uh, by people of that nature. Patrick, do you have any sense of how many guns are out there still that would be considered illegal but have not yet been traded in? So I think it's a Patrick question. Um, if we're talking about the uh, uh, prohibited firearms, we're looking at about 30,000 today. In Alberta? In Alberta, yeah. How do you come to that number? How do you know? Well, there are records, I guess. Um, uh, it is impossible to put an exact number on it because of uh, changes that have occurred in the uh, federal program over time. Uh, but that is uh, today our best estimate. This dedicated investigations unit, is that the one that works with the sheriffs? I, this is a new budget. unit uh, that is coming uh, together as part of the expansion of the uh, firearms office uh, for 
Uh, the last 18 months, we've seen the necessity to work closer with law enforcement and to, uh, um, I guess, have a, a joint path forward in relation to that, and rather it be cited the desk work for uh, experienced uh, firearms officers. Uh, we've created this dedicated unit, and uh, that should be fully staffed uh, in the next couple of months. I see you're calling the budget, though, that it was with the sheriffs, wasn't it? I'm thinking, anyone else? Do you remember that in the budget? Injustice? Maybe it was public safety. Maybe it was Ellis's, yeah, like Ellis's ministry. Because we have split now, so... Yeah, yeah okay. Maybe it's worth a question to them. And the other thing I just wanted to ask, um, another question that came up during the tech briefing was the, I guess there's going to be possibly a panel that would look at the value of these firearms when they are confiscated. Um, so if the value is different, if this, this panel determines that the value is different from what the federal government has set, would the province pay the difference? Like, how does that work exactly? Well, we'll be calling on, on the federal government to, to be uh, paying what we determine to be the, the um, fair market value of that firearm. Um, and because we have heard the concerns from the firearms community that what would be proposed by the federal government would not be a fair market value when, when they're, they, um, their, their firearm is, is uh, turned in to the confiscation program. So this would be us calling on the federal government to pay the what we determine to be the, the fair market value. And you guys wouldn't, wouldn't pay for it. It would just be more of an advocacy, kind of pointing out, look, this, this, we feel that this gun is undervalued according to your list. That's exactly right. And as the framework still needs to be developed, would you be open to working with municipalities on what that looks like for each of them? Saying as how you told Alana nobody has specifically asked for it, would you be willing to work on developing something that works for provincial and municipal jurisdiction? If a, if a municipality is interested in, in taking federal money to be agent or be hiring employees of the municipality to be agents, no. No, we, we would not. Um, we, we have great concerns with municipalities engaging with the federal government to, to take their money to be um, to having municipal employees as, as uh, confiscation agents in, in the program. But would you actually, I mean, if it has to go through your office, would you be like, yeah, sure, go ahead, confiscate? I mean, if, it, if it's in regulation that you have to have a look at these agreements or they have to meet certain terms before they can occur, would you, act, would you actually allow them to do this? This time, no. No, from what we, like, we, we don't have any details from the federal government. We know that there have been vague conversations that the, the federal government has had with municipalities. Um, and we have concerns with that, particularly because the public, and, and we have no details about this and what's being proposed, I don't even think that the municipalities have either. I don't even think that the federal government themselves know what the details would be and what they would propose to any entity that could be included in, in being uh, confiscation agents on behalf of the federal government, whether it's a, you know, um, police or whether it's a private contractor or whether it's a municipality. I don't think they even know. Um, because, as I said, they've never really had the resources or an understanding or the wherewithal to be able to, to implement any, any of the, what's been proposed. Okay, thank you, everyone. Minister, we have to get to the House. So okay. who do you want to be seizure agents? What's that? Who, who should be seizure agents? Well, as I said, we, we've opposed the confiscation program from the beginning. So that's, that's one of our concerns is that the, the, this confiscation program um, is not going to be enhancing public safety. Uh, what we need to be doing is, is um, having targeted initiatives that actually do improve safety in our communities. The federal government for years has actually taken measures that, that don't improve public safety when it comes to, to gun crime. They, they, they're reducing the mandatory minimum penalties for people who are accused and convicted of weapons trafficking. If they're, they're going to pretend that, that any of this is important to them, they should be targeting and working with the provinces in targeting improving safety in our communities and reducing gun crime. And this confiscation program doesn't do that. That's why we've been opposed to the beginning. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Sorry, one more. You don't actually want seizure we disagree with the confiscation program. So we don't think that there should be anyone involved in, in being engaged as a seizure agent for the confiscation program. So how is this not a roadblock then? How is this building? Thank you, everyone. We, Minister, we have to go. Thank you.